Thank you so much. All right, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to, to come see me talk. Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, specifically the future of the dynamic application server, uh, more specifically Nginx unit. Uh, by the way, who here is familiar with Nginx? Um, everyone knows Nginx. Who here knows about Nginx unit or application server? Cool, this is the talk for you guys then. Uh, so, quick introductions, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm a global solutions architect working for Nginx. Uh, I've worked here for about four years and uh, previous to that I worked in site reliability engineering for yellowpages.com. Uh, I'm from LA, but I actually live now in San Francisco. So I flew all the way here just for this conference. Um, and uh, I'm actually I'm going to Berlin tomorrow for We Are Developers as well. Uh, just for fun, I'm a photographer and filmmaker on the side, so if you guys want to talk to me about any of that, I'm also game to, t to chat about that. Um, and uh, yeah, so let's get started here. So quickly, um, on the agenda today, I just want to talk about uh, modernization, so exactly what that means in terms of the application ecosystem, um, how the state of the application server, the application market is right now, um, how, how that's kind of changing, but then also I want to talk more about Nginx unit, what kind of features and functionality it has, uh, and actually uh, what the architecture looks like as well, and why it's kind of useful in a time that we're in right now with this modernization. And then I'm going to try to do some Q&A. So if you're not familiar with Nginx, but I think all you are, um, you know, we got started in 2007. It was originally created by a gentleman named Igor Sisua, who is an engineer. He was working for Rambler, which is the Russian Yahoo, essentially. And uh, he was trying to solve an issue with Apache falling over, taking more than 10,000 concurrent connections, it would just crash. And so he created Nginx uh, with that concurrency issue in mind. And um, since then, we've, we've started a company. So now we have Nginx Plus, which is our commercial version of that. And then we have Nginx Controller, which is our deployment plane or control plane uh, and application monitoring plane as well. But a lot of people don't know about Nginx Unit. And so that's why I'm here today is to kind of evangelize that. Um, Nginx Unit, uh, was a side project for Igor, so he actually created it. Um, and really, uh, it was more about uh, trying to solve a specific gap in the Nginx solution, right? We didn't really have an application server. We had some like modules that you could run on it, uh, but really we wanted to, um, you know, solve that, that solution from, a, from an application standpoint. And so we looked at a bunch of different things and we talked to a lot of different customers when we were in the process of making it production ready. And these are kind of the four top things that I, I kind of feel have really played a part in the way we designed UNIT. Uh, first, services are getting refactored, right? Today, as you guys know, the microservices buzzword is kind of coming into more of a reality. Uh, deployments are needing to be more agile. We're seeing situations where companies are deploying uh, multiple times a day as opposed to previously they might deploy weekly or monthly. Uh, and then there is a requirement for versatile applications, so different programming language, different stacks, different operating systems. Um, we see all sorts of versatility on the web today. And then there's also a demand for security, obviously. But even today, as, as containers are coming out and cloud, uh, multi-cloud uh, architectures, security is very important, right? And so this is a pretty cool quote, uh, or actually not a quote, but a report that was done according to Lightstep. Uh, about 86% of enterprises expect to be using some type of microservices methodology as their default architecture within the next five years. So I remember when I started at Nginx, people were talking about microservices, but they weren't really practicing it. Um, and over the last four years, I think the conversations have been more around like, hey, yeah, we're starting to do it now, right? And uh, it makes sense. And we're looking at containerization, and now we're actually implementing that, and we're looking at service mesh. And so in our eyes, it's really getting close to the point where microservices is going to be the de facto way that you design your applications. Um, modern apps are being m built more distributed, container-based, distributed in the sense that they can be deployed in applications or multi-cloud. Uh, and there's also more of them because they're smaller services uh, and there's smaller instances of those services. Legacy apps are being either modernized, so they're either, either being completely refactored or maybe they're just getting replaced and uh, sw swapped out with microservices. And all of this is basically resulting in more points of failure, uh, which is incre basically creating a need for stronger infrastructure and redundancy. And with, within all of this, uh, the ability to communicate between services is being, uh, I guess, the number one priority as well, because, and that's why you see a lot of interest right now with service mesh, right? 
In regards to agility, uh, according to Amazon, they've increased their velocity of deployments to an average of 11.7 seconds between updates. So that's pretty amazing. I remember at yellowpages.com, uh, we sometimes would take one of our monolith apps, we take all day to deploy. Sometimes if something went wrong, it would be all night and into the next day. Uh, and so what we're seeing is agility is really the key to having a, not only a proactive, but also a reactive business model, right? Uh, and the platform tools that we choose to run those applications uh, also need to be agile and programmable, right? We need to think about APIs, we need to think about uh, downtime, monitoring, health, all that stuff. Uh, and of course, zero downtime is a must nowadays, right? We're making money off of our applications, right? Most, most companies, if an application goes down, I think that's kind of a given. Uh, but with containers, it, you're starting to see more and more services. It gets harder to monitor and see what's going on. Uh, and then also, everyone can probably uh, attest to this. Um, there are lots of programming languages out there, right? Um, and over the years, a lot of us developers have learned to kind of mold ourselves depending on the organization we're in or the company we're in. Um, and we're picking up languages here and there and you kind of become like a jack of all trades in terms of coding, but a master of none or maybe you're a master of one. Uh, really, in most developers, that that's all they do, they tend to focus on one preferred language, right? And specialize in that. And so you, you end up with a sea of applications, right? I think you guys can probably attest if you guys work for a company, there's probably a little bit of this everywhere, right? And so according to a quote from Cloud Foundry Foundation, a multilingual strategy is actually going to improve your business velocity, enable flexibility and profitability and interoperability, and it's going to attract the best developers because you're going to get the developers that they like to code because they're coding in different languages. They like that flexibility. Um, and when it comes down to it, you get these polyglot environments, right, where Ruby, you know, Python, you got Go, you got PHP, uh, all doing different things, and there's specific applications that are good for certain things, right? So, you know, a good, good, good example would be Go is good for doing some kind of like uh, data processing. Uh, Python might be good for machine learning. PHP is good for web applications. And so there's different tasks for different stacks in the organization. And the existing legacy and modern apps sometimes yeah, also need to coexist too, right? You might need to keep PHP because you're running some WordPress site for, I don't know, for the admins or something like that. So. There's this kind of uh, overall uh, need to have that diversity. Also, from a security perspective, it's estimated right now that about 46% of all web applications have some type of security vulnerability. I don't know about you guys, but that's high to me, right? Um, so security is definitely a major concern. About 80% of all web applications have some type of vulnerability, whether it's medium, high, or low. Um, and so what do you think is causing that? Um, some people would say it's the velocity that we're moving, the amount of applications we're creating over that period of time. Some would say it's carelessness on the developer side. Some would say it's just lack of security protocols or uh, implementations. And, and so there's, my, my main point on this is um, a lot of people are putting it on the developers. They're saying, hey, you know, the developers need to think about from a security standpoint, um, or the platform needs to be as secure as possible, right? And so applications are, getting more isolated from each other in that sense. Um, and there's basically a need to be able to limit how those applications can use resources, not only from a application perspective, like server perspective, but also from a network perspective. And uh, also, all, all in all, all this needs to be orchestrated without any performance hit, right? You need to be able to scale and move your applications around and stuff like that without no issue. Um, and with all this complexity that we see with Docker and uh, containerization, really, it gets very complicated fast and it's very difficult to manage. So, Nginx Unit. So, um, Nginx Unit was created to solve all of those problems. Um, we created Nginx Unit a while ago. I would say it's probably been four years ago as a side project, uh, but we didn't release it until 2017. Um, and I know what a lot of you guys are thinking is why are we building another application server? There's so many, right? There's Tomcat, there's you know Apache, there's yada, yada, yada. Everyone has their popular way. Some people don't even want to use an app server, they'll use Go and run NetHTTP or whatever. Um, there's plenty of them, yes, but I'm gonna get into why our particular application server is a little unique. Um, it, first of all, it was rooted in Nginx development. So in that sense, um, it got started from the original creator of 
Nginx, if you guys are familiar with Nginx, from a standpoint of uh, design, is just well designed, and we took the same core values of how Nginx was designed and did that with Unit. And then even better, we made it fully API controlled. So it is fully dynamic in the sense that you configure everything over an API with it. There are no config files. Um, and it's really designed for the modern application stacks, right? It still can run uh, you know, certain languages as, that are uh, kind of more monolithic, but in the sense it's really designed for more cutting edge ap dynamic application servers. It's multilingual. Um, and then we wanted, when, when Igor created it, he wanted to focus specifically on performance, optimization, and orchestration. Uh, and then most importantly, it's open source, which is great because you all can just go download it right now and use it. Uh, it's distributed under Apache 2 license, and um, you know that's always been a core part of uh, Nginx is our community. We have a huge community base. Um, there's about 450 million websites that run on our open source web server, and um, you know Unit is rather new, but it is growing in popularity, and we want to we want to make it available for you guys to to use and to to you know find solutions and problems that we can help solve for you. So now we're going to talk more specifically about the actual unit architecture. Um, when you do first set up unit, um, so in this case I've, I've set up unit as my user account. Uh, so I'm running the main process, you have the main process that's running as root, uh, and then there are two other processes that start up. So there's the main process and then there's two sub -process, processes that you can run as a specific user account. That is the controller and the router. Let me get into what those do in a little bit. And then you can see that we have some applications that are spawned underneath that as well as threads. So we have two unit specific applications. One's called FTM uh, and one is called main page. And then we have another application that's actually running in Go, which is an external application, but Nginx is managing it. Um, uh, and, or I should say unit is managing it. And uh, if we take a closer look at the actual overall um, uh, architecture, we can see there's kind of a lot going on here but I'm gonna walk you guys through it. So if you look up on the top left, you'll see that there's the controller process. Um, this process is specifically listening for all of the HTTP requests that are coming through uh, to, through to unit. Uh, and then it's as it takes those configurations, it's validating to make sure that it's valid JSON, figuring out what it needs to do, and then pushing that configuration out to both the main process and the router process. The main process is owned by root, as I mentioned before, and that's the one that's responsible of managing the actual applications. So if you're telling it, hey, I need a minimum of five PHP threads from this application, and I need a maximum of 10 uh, in case there's a spike in traffic, that main process is managing these processes and making sure that they scale as needed. Um, and again, it's all done in memory. There's no config files. Um, and so same thing as if you uh, create a new listener or a new route or something like that. It's going to push that config to the router process. And then the router process do, is acting as the uh, network connection between the clients over HTTP to those applications. And it's also a worker thread based. So you can have all of the workers running, handling all of the layer seven routing functionality, which I'm going to get into in a little bit. And so you can see it's a well oiled machine, right? Uh, it's very well thought out. Um, then if we look at the, specifically more closer at the router and the application processes on that end, uh, you'll see that, again, client HTTP connections are coming through to the router and that's doing all the, the standard um, uh, TCP handshake and HTTP negotiation and stuff like that. But between the app processes and the router processes, what's unique is we're using shared memory. So there's actually no, t there's no TCP connection, there's no uh, any kind of network connectivity between this. It's all done in memory, so it's very fast, very, very reliable, and very secure. Um, and it's going to basically keep that uh, optimized so that all the routers can talk to the applications via that shared memory zone. Uh, more specifically when it comes to features, um, we got started with a couple of the most common programming languages. So we added PHP, we added Python, and I think we added Perl with the first three. And uh, we said, oh, well, let's just keep going and see what, 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 what we can add and how many we can add. So now we actually support PHP, Python, Perl, Ruby, Go, Node.js, and now we've added Java servlets as well in a kind of a, a experimental. Actually, it might be production ready now. Um, but you get the idea. It's polyglot in the sense that you can run as many different applications as you want. Uh, and you can also run different application versions on the same host. So in other words, you can run Python 2.7 application, and you can also run Py Python 3.6 
right alongside each other on a different network socket. Um, this is nice if you want to just have backwards compatibility for some developers or they want to use, for some reason they're missing a function or something, uh, you can make it available. Uh, and then the cool thing is it's a uniform app configuration in the sense that you're still using the standard API that you're using for Nginx uh, for unit to configure it and you don't have to learn about learning all these different config files, right? You don't need to learn Tomcat, you don't need to learn uh, Apache, you don't need, you know, you're just using the API to do that stuff. Uh, so it's very uniform um, and it's also dynamic by design. So when we say dynamic by design, what do we mean? So uh, I'm saying that on traditional web application servers, if you want to make a change, someone would actually go into there and either push the config file, maybe they went in manually, SSH'd in, changed something and then reloaded the configuration. Maybe they use Ansible or Shaft or some kind of sidecar to push that configuration. But really it's not dynamic. Uh, all those changes are being done either by a person or by another computer, right? Uh, well, that's not how a unit works. So everything is done over API calls. So there's no agent. Uh, everything is native inside of the binary. Uh, it does it in memory and there is no process reload at all. The only time a process is gonna uh, be added is if you need to spawn additional threads of the applications or additional threads of the actual um, uh, routing functionality. That's it. And it's a fully RESTful API, uh, which is great because it was designed with, with obviously the, the, the fundamentals of what a REST API needs to look like. Um, it doesn't rely on any config files. There is a state file, so if you just go home and set it up, you'll look and you'll say, what's the state folder? And there's a configuration file that we keep track of in case for some reason unit, maybe that machine reboots and unit restarts automatically, it's gonna load in the state. Um, but you don't wanna go in there and manually edit that state file. You'll wanna do everything over the API. Um, and it supports all the common methods like get, put, post, delete. So if you just want to get information or if you want to change something, you could do a put or a post depending on what you're trying to change. And then you can also delete just to remove components, remove applications. And it's familiar JSON. So who loves JSON, right? What's better, JSON or YAML? JSON. JSON. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so uh, I want to go through a little bit of the API. Um, so there, there's a lot of different objects right now, uh, but I want to talk about the high level objects. So there is a config, slash config. Uh, there's also a slash certificates uh, endpoint, but I'm going to talk specifically around slash config. So the first conf thing you configure is a listener. Essentially it is defining what socket uh, IP port combination that you want to listen on. Uh, and then where you want to pass that to, right? Do you want to proxy to a specific application? Do you want to proxy to a layer seven uh, check, like a route? Um, and it allows you to map that network connection to the application or network connection to the routes. Then you can define an application object, right? And the application object here, you can see uh, we have three different applications. We can define the actual version that we want to uh, actually load which module, unit module, which user we want to run it as, and then the actual path. So there are unique configurations for each application depending on which type you're using. Uh, so in this case, it's an external application. So anything that's Node.js or Go is gonna be an external application. And then you just reference the user that you wanna use. And you can see here we're able to use separate users for each particular application. Yeah. Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, so over here we have the, then the last one is the PHP, which is just telling us where the index file is. Then we can do routes as well. So we just added this in 1.8 and 1.9, so I think it was like last, like three weeks ago. Um, you can now match based on the host name, so the actual domain name, the URL with, with actual uh, wildcards. We're adding regular expression soon, so you'll be able to do Perl compatible regular expression. And then you can do things like arguments as well, so you can route based on an argument and a value. Um, and you can do, then you, so you basically pass it from the listener to the route and then the route to the application. So imagine it's kind of like an internal hop, right? So we do fully support all these methods right now, arguments, cookies, headers, hostname methods, uh, and URI. It is secure. We use OpenSSL. You do need to use OpenSSL 1.01 plus, uh, and it allows you to do all those changes to the certificates. You can manage those in memory as well. There's no downtime there. And there are no shared credentials. So like I mentioned before, you can have, you don't have it's not required to use shared credentials. You can have a separate uh, user account for a separate, every application, and you can have a separate user account for the API. 
And then obviously the main process needs to be owned by root. If one app fails, it doesn't affect the other one. Uh, so everything is isolated and the server is essentially uniformly configured. Um, and this adds resiliency, right? Um, and then you also have some stuff that I didn't go into where you can make it have a certain amount of processes that are always running so that if application does crash, it will instantly recover and come back up. You can also change the amount of memory allocation for an application, make it respawn automatically, stuff like that. Um, and then I think we're all good here. Oh, this is stuff we're adding next. We're adding WebSocket support, uh, proxy enhancements, so more stuff, uh, regular expressions, stuff like that. We're adding static file support, and we're looking for new, new languages too. So if you guys have interest in push, pushing some kind of recommendations, you can do it on our GitHub. Um, so if you go to unit.nginx.org, that's the best place for information. If you want to email uh, an alias, it's unit at nginx.org. And also there's a ton of blogs and like um, documentation on nginx.com as well around that. So thank you guys for coming. Any questions at all?